נכניס לקצ'ר בעזרת השם לעילוי נשמת ריטה מזל בת כסייה, סבטלנה גולדה בת סרח, רפאל בן דוד, and also לרפואה דבורה אלישבע בת שרה, and יונה בת כסייה, and להצלחה במשפט ליוסף בן שמחה. Before we start the lecture, I just want to make one announcement that a lecture from last Monday, we posted it on, uh, on YouTube and shortly after, less than an hour, they took it off. We still don't understand why they took it off. They claim for that I spoke about something medical, but I didn't speak about anything medical. We really think that maybe it's because of the name. We wanted to name the lecture, take us back to Auschwitz. Remember the, the, the nation wanted to go back to Egypt? We wanted to give a name for people to get curious. In the end, I think the algorithm just looked at it as something bad, you know? Even though the lecture itself, obviously, is pro-Jewish, but, but there's nobody to talk to. So I just want you to know that there was one strike, if we get another strike, because the lefty liberals, they complain all the time, you know how it is. If we get one more strike, we won't put any more lectures on YouTube. So I would suggest the lecture that we post, we post them on uh, Rumble. We post them on Rumble. I, I, I heard that on Rumble there's no way to search. So if you put Rabbi Yossi Mizrahi, nothing will come out. I don't, know how, I don't understand the logic here. I don't understand how these companies work. So you have to see, right now when we post the lecture, we actually give the address of the, of the page. So the lectures will stay there. In Rumble, there's no limitation. They're not liberals, they're not lefties, so the lectures should be there. I'm considering changing the video player of my website to Rumble. Like this, automatically, it will be only there. So it's up to you. If you want to be, you know, a listener of the lectures in the future, I suggest that you will remember what I just say, because it's very, very possible that in the next week or two, you won't have any more lectures on the, on the, on the YouTube channel, because it's too much of a risk. They, they block your mouth, they don't let you talk, or they see a name they don't like, they, they put you out of business. I heard that they took off uh, people that had millions of views. <laughs> I mean, by us, uh, we, we are peanuts compared to these pages. A person has, I don't know, five, ten million uh, fans on his page, and then in one minute he loses everything he built in 20 years because the algorithm checked something in the name and they didn't like it. I don't understand how it works. Also, I suggest that everyone will download my app. It's about time. On the app and on my website, you will always have lecture. In social media that belongs to others, maybe yes, maybe not, we don't know. So please download the app, it's free. Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, it's free. Apple is free, the Android is free. You get, you get the lectures live, free of charge. It comes to your phone, what can be better than that? And there's no commercials. Commercial, I think Hashem is upset that people go on these, these channels that display all kinds of dirty commercials. Even though in the setting we did not allow any commercials that is not modest. But the way we look at modesty, and the way that the goyim look at modesty, I don't have to tell you, there's a big difference, right? So there's no way to block it completely. I suggest that it's about time, there's more than 40,000 people on a, on a channel. There's no reason that all of them should not download the app. If all of them download the app, we're not in the hand of anyone. But I don't know why people are so stubborn. We keep saying it over the years, again and again and again, and 90% of the people still did not down, uh, download the app. And the app doesn't catch any room on the, on the memory of your phone. It's very small, relatively. It's like any other small app. It's not that it's one of those apps that you know, drain your phone or anything like that. 
and on the app you have fast speed, one and a half times, one and a quarter, 1.75, two times speed. And there's all kinds of features in the app that other channels do not let. Plus you have the, the calendar that, tell, that tells you in advance where the lecture is going to be. It's about time. Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, download it. Those who prefer to hear it on a website, they can go to divineinformation.com or to torahanytime.com. The lecture is there. For instance, that lecture, that lecture, we could only post on Torah anytime. Why? Because if we post it on Divine Information, the player is YouTube. It will show that the lecture was removed. Torah anytime has their own player, not uh, YouTube or anything like that. Why? Because they store the lecture on their own servers. To store the lecture on your own server, it's, it's something that you need to have your own servers. And, and I had, I remember I was using this company, GoDaddy, which is a big, uh, they're hosting a lot of websites. And one day, without any warning, they decided to take me off. When I called them up, they said that you are equal to 400 other businesses. And you pay a price of one. We decided to take you off. Why? Because the amount of lectures, they don't want to store it on their server. It takes a lot of room. So, okay, why wouldn't you give me a few days to be able to move all the lectures somewhere else? Just shut the, shut the, the, the page and that's it. Yeah, that's it. But the miracle was that the day they did it, I have to tell you this, you should know the hand of Hashem is always working. That night, it was Tuesday. On my way to Brooklyn, I found out that the server is no longer active, meaning the website is off. And we do not have backup of all the lectures. What are we going to do now? We have thousands of lectures. We have to start moving them, and we don't have the lectures. Give us at least 48 hours to download the lectures, and then put us off. Nothing to talk about. So that night, you're not going to believe it. I had a guy, Israeli guy, came to speak to me in a lecture on Tuesday night. I don't know him, never saw him before. And he said, I have to speak to you about a personal matter. Something personal. As we speak about something personal, I ask him, what do you do in America? What's your, what's your job? He told me I build apps and I have a server that hosts websites. <laughs> I say, you serious? You came right on time. A few hours ago, they, they cut my server off. What? Yeah. The guy, the guy worked for three days to take all the lectures. I don't remember where he took them from, from YouTube or from Torah and Ita. I don't remember from where. He was working with the software three days to transfer all the lectures. Most of them he was able to save. Some of them were broken uh, link, but we saved 99% of the situation. And then, since then until now, I'm still on his server. It's, 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 I don't know how many years already. But just to show you that uh, it was all mamash with Ashgacha of Hashem. What are the odds that a person would show up with a personal matter and he has a company that hosts host websites. Same thing happened with the shipping guy. The shipping guy had a Satmer Hasid that was doing shipping for me, Tzadik. And then one day he said, listen, I'm selling a crystal. Nobody buys it anymore. Today with Amazon, this, eh? it's not worth it to waste time. So I'm just letting you know, as of Thursday, I won't be able to do shipping. This was Monday. Then Tuesday I come to Brooklyn, and a guy comes, Ovadia. If you come to Brooklyn, you know who I'm talking about. He always come to take the packages, the, the books and the CDs and the tefillin. He said to me, Rabbi, who does your shipping? So I had a guy, but that's it. As of Thursday, I'm not going to have a, Can I help you with the shipping? If, if you need to hire a shipping guy, you have to pay him a few thousand dollars a month. Plus, besides the cost of all the packages and the, and, the, and the things you have and delivery and 
you need a facility that the UPS come to pick it up. It's a little bit complicated. So with the lousy donations that my organization gets, you can't even uh, hire a cleaning lady. Forget it, there's no donations basically, almost nothing. Almost nothing. Instead of millions of dollars that should come, a few thousand dollars a month, now it's the worst it's ever been in 25 years, now in the last month or two, since I came back from Israel, the worst it's ever been. It's mamash almost completely frozen. Two, three donations a day. Once in a while you get a nice donation, a few hundred dollars, but most of them less than $20 donations. Just show you how many people suffer financially. People who used to give a lot don't give at all. People who used to do monthly canceling their subs subscription. You can, every day, this customer cancel, and what's cancel? $50 a month, $36 a month, $18 a month. People cancel $18 a month. S since I work with very high volume, Baruch Hashem, of so many Baalei Tshuva over the years, if every one of them will give $18 a month, we could have made another thousand Baalei Tshuva extra every month. Extra. Because very simple. You take a video like the Shabbat film that I made. You want to promote it on Facebook. How are you going to get to half a million secular Jews? How? It will take you five years. What are you going to do? Put ads in the newspaper? Put ads in CNN? What are you going to do? You're going to pay millions of dollars for it. So what's the, way, the cheapest way today? It's to promote. You put a lecture on, without promoting it, you're going to have, if you're lucky, 30,000 views. That's it. That's the amount of with sharing, with everything. After a month or two, maximum 30,000, let's say. I'm just giving you a rough idea. If it's a very, very good film, maybe 50,000 you get. But once you begin to pay them 1,000, another 1,000 dollars, another 1,000, the numbers go up 10 times faster. Mamash, you see right away. Within two to three weeks, it already went up to more than 300,000 views. One hour of film with all the proofs about Shabbat. 300,000 Israelis watched it. Let's assume that 90% of them were not Shomer Shabbos, because they spread it to all Tel Aviv, Haifa, all these places. So you get to almost 300,000 people for six, seven thousand dollars, whatever it is. It costs you a few dollars a person, and there is a very high chance that that person after that film will not be Mechalel Shabbat anymore. And there's no money to do it. Better than CDs. Better than CDs, definitely. That's why we do less CDs now. We will try to do it this way. Plus, a lot of people don't have CD players in a car anymore. All right? So now we do USBs. The USB is beautiful. It also shows the app on it, the website, information. People stick it in a car. They have 2,000 hours of lecture. That's the best, USBs. Because the person is becoming addicted to the lectures. There's always a chance he's going to throw it to the garbage and never plug it in. But if you speak to them a few words when you give it to him, let's say people sponsor USBs, they order. They give it to their friends at work, neighbors, relatives. They give them the USB and they tell them, you have to listen to it. Give it one hour of your time. Try it. First lecture come, Torah and science. Oh, very interesting. The Torah knew all these things 3,000 years ago. Then purpose of life, then life after death. Then one series after the other, all of them. And then every topic, every topic they can think of, they see over there. And if they plug it to the computer, they see files, 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 non-stop lecture. 2,000 hours for a few dollars. Every USB costs a few dollars. Where are we going to find a better investment? But people don't understand the potential. They don't understand. I don't know who they give their master to. Without knowing, I'm sure one million percent, nothing comes even to one percent close to this potential. Because you make one Baal Tshuva, he will produce billions of mitzvot for you in the next 20, 30 years. Him, his children, grandchildren, forever and ever. That's the best investment. That's why the Satan fights the most, obviously. The Satan 
would want people to give money to reform synagogue. Why? Because it's worse than a church. Give it. Give to the church, give to the reform, give to the conservative, give to the very modern orthodox that became reform. Very good. Throw your money over there. Why? It helps me. Who is me? The Satan. The Satan say, you're helping me out. You're doing my job in the world. When you donate to a reform place, I'm very happy. You're going to spend $40 million to build this impure place, Temple of Avodah Zarah and Mechalelei Shabbat, where 95% of them are not Jewish. So very good. Throw your money over there. Million dollar for this, two million for that, half a million for that. Aaron Kodesh, if you can call it Kodesh Bechlal. So the, the Satan is very happy. The Satan is very happy that you give it to an Orthodox synagogue that people there come just to speak politics on Shabbat and sport. They don't really care about the davening. So the Satan, when finally a Jew wants to be generous and to give a nice donation, the Satan will always send him to a place that the money that he gives over there either will be worthless or will produce a lot of sins. Because that's fantastic for the Satan. It is beautiful. This guy just gave a million dollars to this organization. That will create for me billions of sins. How wonderful. How wonderful. The Satan is very happy. And that Jew lives in a dream like he did such an important mitzvah. Thinking. Thinking. So, this is just to give you an idea. I remember one time the interview the chairman of the, of the bank, what's his name, was Greenspan? Before Bernanke, what was the one that was in charge of, huh? Yeah, I think so, yeah, a Jew, very old, close to eight years old. They interview him on Yom Kippur, coming with his car to the shul, <laughs> to the reform synagogue. And he said, well, what, what, how do you, what do you, you know, they ask him some question. He said, I, I came to pray that this year, Pray to God that this year we will have better luck in the market or whatever. On Yom Kippur they drive a car. Who built that place? 30, 40 million dollar place. You know, hundreds of places like this you have in America. Every one of them is very expensive piece of land. And to build, they don't build simple. They build very fancy. There's no minyanim there, no shachrit, no mincha, no arvit. And Shabbos, they come with a car, valet parking, microphone, women singing with their curly hair and mini skirts and high heels. You know, they make parties inside. They marry Jews with non Jews. They married men with men. They do the most despicable things in the eyes of Hashem. Someone sponsored that activity. A lot of naive fools. When finally people wants to give to a good orthodox cause, also the Satan get involved. Obviously, a Baal Shuva that listens many, many years to kosher lectures, he knows not to give to those places. So he's thinking, what should I do over here? Something productive. Also the Satan trick him. I'll give you an example. There are some kosher organizations who spread Torah. You can listen to a lot of lectures there. But how much money they need? They have two, three employees, whatever they make a year, plus the office. They don't come to half a million dollar a year expenses. And every fundraising they do, it's three million, one million, five million. Every year, another one and another one. That's besides all the routine donations. So these organizations, some of them collect 10, 15 million dollars a year, when in reality they don't need even half a million. I don't know, ask them. I'm just giving you an example how the Satan is a genius, that he, even the most kosher people that would like to do really the right thing in the eyes of Hashem, thinking that's the right thing, in the end they're gonna get very disappointed. Why? Because the idea over here, Abota, I have to know, I sent one time a person to Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Zatzal. That person was about to give a large amount of money to a yeshiva. They promised him any promise you can think of, the people of that yeshiva, any, anything you can think of. I said, you know what, before you do it, 
I want you to go to my cousin. In Yerushalayim, you are in Yerushalayim. Even though he doesn't like that I send him people. But before you spend a million dollars, I think you should speak to a Chacham. So he went to him, he spoke to him, he told him, nobody can promise you this. You know, he's not God. What, what does it mean, promise? You know, Hashem, Hashem will do what he... Promise? You can promise? Only Hashem can promise Olam Abba. And how the Olam Abba will be. So uh, my cousin is very humble. He said, you know what? Why do you ask me? Go to Rav Chaim Kanievsky. He went to Rav Chaim Kanievsky. He asked him, what should I do? Should I give to Yeshiva? Or should I give to Kiruv? Rav Chaim Kanievsky say, this generation have to give to Kiruv. He went back to my cousin, and my cousin gives his life for the Torah. His Torah is all his life. He said to him, I want to write a few comments. Please go back to Rav Chaim Kanievsky and show it to him. Telling you the whole story. He went back a second time. He said, the Chacham over there, the Chacham over there, is uh, the Chacham over there, he asked a few questions, I want to show it to you. And, uh, you know, what do you think? He looked at what he wrote, and he said to him, okay, he's right, with his points, so you should sp split from now on your money 50-50. 50% for saving souls, 50% to support people that sit and learn seriously Torah all day. And this is what I have. I have yeshiva in Yerushalayim, and plus the yeshiva here in Monsi for Baalei Tshuva, which we help the Bachurim all the time, sit and learn. How they can sit and learn? Who gives them all their expenses? Who pays for them? Where they need, whenever they need. As we speak of, I'm finishing here. I have to run quickly to Brooklyn, just like last week, to a wedding of a Bachur from our yeshiva. In his thirties, getting married tonight. How are you gonna, you have to raise the money for the whole wedding. The people that sit and learn, they don't have money for the wedding, for everything. It's a lot of money. So this is an idea of how you build homes in Eretz Israel. It's getting married to a religious girl in five, ten years from now. So, on the app we have the repeat. You can download and get it. Plus, you know, you can always watch the repeat and make it on a faster speed, so instead of two and a half hours, become an hour and 15 minutes, save you some time, and you get the entire lecture. Anyway, Rabotai, I wanted to speak tonight about some of the issues that we read in a parasha of, of Shabbat, the story of the Meraglim, the spies. Uh, the last parasha, a week ago, it was Be'alotcha, speaking about Miriam, the prophet, the sister of Moshe and Aaron. The sister of Moshe and Aaron, speaking Lashon Hara about Moshe for a good purpose, not out of hate, out of love. She loves her young brother very much. So, Hashem did not, did not like it. She was complaining why Moshe separated from his wife temporarily. He doesn't touch her. There's no intimacy between them. Why? Because Moshe said, if Hashem told me that he's about to give the Torah, everyone should separate from their wife for three days before Matan Torah. If to receive the Torah from Hashem in Ma'amad Ar Sinai, you cannot go next to a woman for three days, I speak with Hashem every all the time. He comes to me, speaks to me, gives me instruction. Then I should separate from my wife all the time. Why? Because I'm speaking to Hashem every day. They only have one event, Ma'amad Ar Sinai. Why did Hashem say, to the Jews to separate from their, from their wives for three days. Because after intimacy, there are three more days that the, the effect of the man with the woman still, still fresh for three days. After that, it's no longer effective. So therefore, there's all kinds of things that can cause the people to become impure. Therefore, three days 
to be completely safe, to come for Matan Torah after Mikveh, a hundred percent. Sometimes you come to the Mikveh and there can be all kinds of leaks which create, again, impurity. So the whole Mikveh was for nothing. So what happened? Let's be on the safe side. Moshe thought, if that's the case, but the, but the mistake of Moshe was that uh, the reason that Hashem didn't want them to do it, not because of they have to speak to Hashem, because of the reason I just mentioned. There's nothing to do with Moshe. He can go to the mikveh and that's it. Anyway, in the end, Miriam had a complaint. She was right about her complaint, but she spoke against Moshe. And that didn't look good. Meaning 100% true. Not that she made up a lie or something, like people do today. Make up a whole lie. Speak the truth against her young brother for his own good. For his shalom bayit. For his peace in the family with his wife. Trying to avoid problems. Meaning 100% for the sake of heaven. And she got leprosy. Immediately. Isolated. One week of embarrassment. Everybody see the holy Miriam, the prophet. That thanks to her they have a well that they drink every day. She's putting like in a jail in a way. This isolation is like putting someone in jail for a week. Can come near anyone. You know the embarrassment? Imagine what people thought. Wow, what, what she have done? That Hashem did this to her. Who knows what she said? I wish our Lashon Ara would be like this, to try to help someone for his own good. <laughs> we will get probably a prize for it. But it's Moshe Rabbeinu, and Hashem said, how did you not fear to talk against my servant Moshe? It's a sensitive issue for me. That's how the parasha more or less ended last week. Now on the last Shabbat, another story of Lashon Hara. Spies talking about the Holy Land, and the Chachamim say, why they are close to each other in the Torah, these two cases? That the spies should have learned a lesson from the story of Miriam never to open their mouth to speak Lashon Hara about the Holy Land, that it's so important to Hashem. And since they heard and saw what happened to Miriam when she meant for good cause, and Hashem got upset, they should have been extra, extra careful not to dare to say one thing that will cause the nation of Israel to hesitate if they should move to Israel or not. Right now they are in the desert. This is a story. They should have learned. Since they didn't, Hashem is extra upset with them. Now I want to ask you a question. You know, Hashem said to Moshe, if you would like to view the gift that I'm about to give you, send people to view the gift. What is it like? Let's say a father wants to buy a car to the mother, let's say. And he asked his son to the dealer to test the car, drive it, see it, make a video, bring it and tell her how nice the car is. What is she going to get? And the, car, the, the kid goes, the father sent him on a mission to back him up, to come and say to the mother, how wonderful the car that dad wants to buy you. And what is this boy did? Ah, the car, yeah, it has some good features, but this one and that one and this and the color and that. And he comes back and ruined the whole gift. Now we have to find out why did he do such thing? If he did it because he thought the car is not respectable enough and the father could afford something much better, and maybe with more room, and when she goes uh, shopping, she will have more room for the grocery, or it's safer in case of an accident, it can save life, and has all kinds of security features. So the boy was worried about the safety of his mother, and therefore he spoke 
לשם שמיים, for the sake of heaven. If that's the case, no. At least he has something to justify what he did. But if he comes and speaks against the car because he himself wants something and he doesn't get, or he's jealous, or it's going to give him headache because now he's going to have to move his car when she brings her car, for personal reasons, nothing to do with her. He doesn't care about her. He only cares about himself. That's when it becomes a serious issue. Then you come and give a whole speech using some true elements from the story, because every lie is built on the truth. If a lie is a hundred percent lie from the beginning to the end, it doesn't have an existence. But if you put the lie on top of the truth, the truth remains forever. The truth has an endless power to be eternal. So the only energy that the lie will get to survive for X amount of time, a year, five years, 20 years, is only when you put it on the truth. That's why the liars, the good liars, if you can call it the good liars, they're very stupid, but at least they know how to lie, according to their opinion. The good liars, they never tell a story that is fully a lie. They use some details that are true, and that's what convinced the people that he's telling the truth. He did this and that, he gave a few compliments, and then they begin with the lies and the exaggeration and made up stuff. Since you already heard a few of the things that they said that you know yourself that it's really true, you don't go and check the rest of the details. Sometimes one detail changed the entire purpose of the story. From positive, it turns to complete negative. Because all the good elements become obsolete once you add a lie to the story. That lie eliminates everything. But why did you bring out the truth? To convince the person to eat the lie. And that's how they do it. They give some compliments, they talk about some of the truth, and then they begin with the lies. Same thing over here. They talked about the funerals. There were funerals. They talked about the giant. There were giants there. They talked about the huge fruits. There was big fruits there. But why did they really speak what they spoke? Only for one reason. For their own personal good. And I will explain it to you in case you didn't know. Most people don't pay attention to the small details, but the small details sometimes change the entire understanding of the story. We have all the spies. Levi doesn't go. Levi doesn't need to go. They don't get a piece of the land anyway. So they go now, and uh, Moshe calls Yoshua, his student, and he gives him a blessing. Special blessing, why? That you should not fall into politics. You should get saved from what can, ha can happen. Rega. Question is, why he did not call Kalev? We see after the fact that Kalev was also tzaddik. Not just Yoshua, Ma Moshe didn't know. When they went on their mission, all of them had a status of righteous people. That's what the Torah say. That's what Rashi said. That's what all the Mepharshim say. When they became wicked, after they came and spoke what they spoke. Meaning up to then, they were still not considered wicked. Everyone was righteous. After what happened, only two remained righteous. Yoshua and Kalev. So if that's the case, if you say Moshe saw it coming, he should have known that Kalev is good for it. Why he didn't give him the blessing? If Moshe saw that Yoshua and Kalev are righteous more than the others, they don't think about themselves, what's the point of giving Yoshua a blessing? Anyway, you know, he's righteous enough not to do such horrible thing. What's really happening here? We have to understand, Rabotai. Now you're going to learn the secret. The secret is, Yoshua heard Eldad and Medad. 
having a prophecy in their tent. Remember a few weeks ago? He ran to Moshe, tell them to be quiet, give them a punishment. Why? Moshe said. I just heard them having a prophecy. What's the prophecy? Moshe is going to die and Yoshua will enter the nation of Israel to the Holy Land. That's what Eldad and Medad are saying. Moshe met, Yoshua machnis. Moshe will not go to Israel, and Yoshua will bring us into Israel. Yoshua, if he was a politician, like the leaders we have today, all these clowns, he should have been very happy. Right? A vice president, as much as he's faithful to the president, will dance when the president will have some kind of medical issues. What's her name, this uh, vice president? Kamala. Kamala, nobody looks at her now. Tomorrow morning she can become the number one person in the world, meaning power-wise. If Sleepy Joe will forget again his name and something will happen, he won't know where he is. They will come to a conclusion, that's it. The bluff is no longer working. We can't any, uh, continue forever telling him what to say. I don't know what he said a few days ago. Long live the queen. Nobody understands what he talks about. <laughs> they try to understand what he said, just like we try to understand sometimes what Rashi and Tosfot say. Right? Nobody understands what he's talking about. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, where's the queen? When? Queen in America? What, you in England? Nobody understands. No! But at least he's walking. He can still walk. Hopefully without falling. So what happened? What happened? God forbid, I don't wish him any bad, but God forbid if he has a, a serious medical thing that he cannot function anymore. That's it. She becomes the President of the United States for the next year. She can make critical decisions, affect the whole world and the history of the world. Right? Now, if something like this will happen, she will sit home and cry, and she will be dancing with her husband, the liberal Jew, and drink red fine wine together, whatever his name, that Jew. Kamala, congratulations. Hi, darling. We are in power, right? I should be happy. If you come to her now in a closed room, and say, Kamala, I have two buttons over here. Green and red. Green, you become the president. Red, sleepy Joe stay another year. What she would do? I'll give you one guess. All of you are right. So how come Yeshua is upset? You should be very happy. You know what an honor it is? Young, becoming the leader of the chosen people, in history, everyone will know who you are. You become the most important person in the world, in the eyes of Hashem. Why you run to Moshe to tell him? Punish them. Should have been happy, be quiet. Wow, yes. I'm going to bring them into Israel. I'll be the king. Moshe for sure goes to heaven. I'm not worried about him. Oh, Hashem, I don't wish him bad. He loves his rabbi. But he goes to heaven, so what's the problem? I'll be in charge. No, he got upset. Why? He loves his rabbi and respect him so much and admire him so much. The Gemara says, Moshe is the sun, Yoshua is like the moon. What does he mean, the moon? First, the moon is a tiny thing compared to the sun. The sun is a thousand times bigger than earth. The moon is smaller than earth. It's a reflection. The moon doesn't have its own light. All the light we see in the moon is reflection of the sun. You compare the sun to the moon, there's nothing to compare. It's like comparing a cubic zirconia to a real diamond. It looks alike, <laughs> you know, but there's nothing to compare. So that's what the Gemara say. Moshe was the sun, the shining sun, Yoshua la Kareach, the moon. Not Chaz Shalom to insult Yoshua, but to show you who was Moshe. Moshe, Yoshua gets upset, he runs to Moshe, he says, why they dare to say such thing? And Moshe said, why are you upset? I wish all the nation will be prophets. I mean, it doesn't even bother him. And that's what they said. Why? First of all, every bad prophecy can be canceled. I'm going to now start praying, crying to Hashem. 
just like every decree that I cancel until now, I'll cancel this decree as well. That's what he thought. But after 515 prayers that shook the heavens, Hashem told him, do not pray the next one, because then I will be forced to let you in. And he basically blocked his prayers. And in the end, he didn't enter Israel. So the question now is, why in the world Hashem chose Yoshua ben Nun to be the leader? It wasn't in the list. It wasn't in the list, just like in the army. You have the chief of command, right? The head of the whole army. In Israel, they call him Ramatkal. Under him, you have Alufim. Aluf, 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 Aluf. The, all the Alufim of Esav. Aluf, Aluf, Aluf. Then you have Tat Aluf. And then you have Aluf Mishneh. And then you have Sgan Aluf. And then you have Rav Seren. And then you have Seren. And then you have Segen. They have a <laughs> Segen needs 30 years to become Rav Aluf, meaning the chief of command. But now, if you have the chief of command retire, who are you going to put? One of the Alufim, right? You don't go to Sgan Aluf. Sgan Aluf is 10 years behind, minimum. It takes time until you get to the top of the pyramid. Yoshua was Sar Hamishim. You have Sare Meot, Sare Hamishim, Sare Asarot. So the higher your rank is, the more people are under you. Sare Meot, meaning each one is in charge of a hundred people. They report to him, he's the rabbi, he tells them what to do. So there are 600 men, Sare Meot. Yoshua is Sar Hamishim, he's in charge of 50s. Oh, he didn't even get to the top level. There are 600 candidates to inherit Moshe Rabbeinu. Or 70 elders that he chose, they are the highest level. So one of the 70, if not them, one of the 600. If not them, then one of all the Sare Hamishim. Why all of a sudden Yoshua will take the place of Moshe? Every one of the spies thought Yeshua has nothing compared to us. If anyone deserves, it's one of us. Once they heard Eldad and Medad having a prophecy that Moshe is going to die and Yeshua is going to be the king, the leader, they went crazy in their mind. Ma! We will destroy Israel and not let him become the prime minister. Similar to Bibi. <laughs> not that you can compare Bibi to Yeshua ben Nun. He can't even be the shoelace of Yoshua ben Nun, with all due respect to him. Yeah, but uh, there's nothing to compare. I just want you to understand the concept. The lefty liberals now burning Israel. Today they made the airport again on a strike. Why? Because the right is say, we will still make the reformer. Ah, yeah, Psh, strikes everywhere. Again, demonstrations. I just don't understand why Netanyahu is such a coward. I don't understand. Anyway, they destroy the country right now. Anyway, they demonstrate everywhere. Anyway, they use every power they have to hurt Israel. They're already doing it. Finish with the reform already. What is this hesitation? If they would say, if you do it, we'll do it. If not, we'll behave. No, I understand why you're afraid. You don't want chaos. But if they make chaos anyway, go with that full force, two, three months, finish it, and say, go to hell, that's it. Why do I care about you? We got elected, this is democracy, we run the show. You don't like it, move to Switzerland. Maybe move to Saudi Arabia, you get a nice treatment from them over there. Someone sent me today, uh, a little article about some Muslim council, councilmen that refused to allow gay rights or gay parade, something in his town, something. Um, I don't have time to read all these articles. I just try to understand between the lines. Meaning, maybe we have to hope that there will be some radical Muslims as leaders and uh, congressmen in this country. <laughs> Why? At least they will fight abomination. These liberal Jews, they will fight abomination? Forget it. 
last thing, they want to improve abomination, to spread it as, more, as much as possible. I'm ashamed to say it, but the truth is the truth, as painful as it may be. So now the spies, they have a power now. Each one of them is a president. If they move to Israel and Yoshua become the leader, they lose their job. They're no longer in Congress. They're nothing. They're nothing. Even now their position, they have, they have nothing. Why? It's going to be one leader. That's it. So they say, it's not fair. Hashem doesn't know what he's doing. How did he choose him over us? We have to do everything we can for the people not to agree, not to agree to move to Israel. That's when they begin to get everyone scared. To get everyone scared. And then you saw what happened. Everybody started to cry, crying. And Hashem said, oh yeah, you're crying? After everything I've done for you, you saw everything and you still worry? You cry for nothing? I will make sure you cry for eternity in this day. When was it? Tisha B'Av. It's coming soon. Now it's Rosh Chodesh Tammuz today. We have 39 days until Tisha B'Av. So this was 39 days from today, this event. That everybody started to cry and to complain. Hashem say, Atem bechitem bechia shel chinam, v'ani eten lachem livkod bechia ledorot. I will make you cry for generations. Why? Because you cry for nothing. Meaning, what do we learn from here? If you complain and you cry about nonsense, Hashem is giving you now a reason to cry for real. I'll give you an example. Let's say you got fired from your job. You had a nice job, you made good money, you have some savings, you're okay, you're not going to be on the street. You have some incomes from here and there over the years. You lost your job, you have to now go interviews until you find a job. You begin to cry, get depressed, why do I deserve it, I can't take it, ah, crying all day, complaining all day. Hashem said, oh, that's what it is. Third years I took care of everything you have, you have a home, you got married, you married your children. You're 50 something years old, now you got fired. How do you know? Maybe I want to make, want to give you a much bigger, better job. You already suffered here 20 years, you hate this job. Maybe I have a much better plan for you. Where is your fate? No fate. It's all me. I made the money, I work, I lost my job, I'm nothing now. What about Hashem? He was never in the picture, in his mind. What does Hashem do? Give him now a real reason to cry. He comes the next morning to his mailbox, IRS, we need to talk to you. What happened to the crying of yesterday about losing the job? Completely forgot about it. Now he begins to cry about the headache he's going to have. Get all the receipts, get all that. And if he's going to run into trouble, maybe he has to pay a lot of money or even to go to jail, who knows? That's how life is all about. You cry about your stupid car, or about the flat tire, or about something that you should never cry and complain about. Two, three, four weeks later, or a year, or a, or a year later even, Hashem is gonna give chas v'shalom a reason to cry for real this time. You cry over your stupid baseball team that lost the championship, for that you cry. You wait and see what you're gonna have to cry next. But people don't understand. They continue with their nonsense. They cry for nonsense, and then Hashem made them cry for real. That's a concept in the Torah, I did not make it up. You cry, you dare to cry for nothing? For something good that I've done for you? I'll make sure you cry for real reason. Why? Your temple will be destroyed, thousands of people will die every day. That's what happened on Tisha B'Av, all the tragedies, Tisha B'Av. I urge you to go to Israel on the day of Tisha B'Av and look at the water every year. Every year make sure you go and watch. You get the shock of your life. You get the shock of your life. You walk five steps into the water, the water 
does not reach your knees. Can you drown? If the water does not reach your knees, can you drown or no? There's no life risk. Even babies can go in. It's very, very low, the, the level of the water. In less than five, 10 seconds, you, the water pulls you in, the, you cannot hold. Even if you have very strong athletic legs, the water begin to, it's like someone grabbing you and pushing you in. You cannot resist. It's like, 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 like 500 people pulling you in. In less than 10 seconds, you find yourself already in all kinds of uh, turbulence, whatever you call it. And you don't know what to do. How many people drown? Today, a 20 years old religious Breslev girl died, drowned to death. When this trouble water begins, Rosh Chodesh Av until 10 Tov Av, every year. 10 days massive, massive attack on the water of the Holy Land. You don't have it in Greece, you don't have it by Egypt. It's the same ocean, just in Israel. You cannot walk into the water, why? The, life, uh, the lifeguards, they don't, every day they come in the morning early, they check the water and they decide what flag to stick. Red, white is good, black is not good, but not so dangerous. They show you where you can go and where you cannot go. They want to make sure they watch everyone. On the 10 days of Tisha B'Av, automatically, no one should go in. Why? There's anger on the world. These days is days of tragedies. People drown, all kinds of problems, kids in camps. This is summertime. Lots of kids go to camp. Hashem Rachem, how many horrible things happen over the years in these days. So Rabotai, the spies, they will start making every possible trick to make people get scared to enter Israel. Why? As long as we are in the desert, we're still in charge. Everybody kiss our hand and get, and get instructions from us. But if we go to Israel, we become nothing. If we become nothing, no one would look at us. So what we have to do to make sure we stay in the desert as long as we are alive? What happened after? It's not our business. Yoshua, why did Moshe Rabbeinu give him only the blessing? Because Moshe knew that Yoshua loves him very much. And after he heard the prophecy that Moshe dies and Yoshua will bring the nation of Israel into Israel, Yoshua is the first one that should have, do, should have done everything he could to make the nation refuse to go to Israel. That his rabbi will not die. Because as long as they are in the desert, Moshe will not die. He will only die before they have to enter the land. So I want to extend the life of my rabbi. But you have to go into the Holy Land. What do I care about the Holy Land? This is the rabbi, this is my life. Without him, I'm nothing. I can't live without him. I'm his servant. Yoshua is an ar, lo yamush min oil. Very faithful to Moshe, everything he does. He cleans the shul, when they prayer, he's a mamash, in charge of everything. What happened in the end? Moshe was afraid that Yoshua will be the one that will cause problem to save his life. That's why he gave him a special blessing that in case he has this kind of agenda or political agenda, personal political agenda, that he should get saved from this kind of Yetzirah. So in the end, Yoshua got a special blessing and he got saved. Maybe thanks to the blessing. Tov. The spies didn't get saved. Okay, then get a blessing. So who is the only one who got blessing? Who is the only one who didn't get blessing and stayed righteous? Kalev! If you remember, we read the Aftarah on Shabbat. Very similar story. Yoshua also sent spies. But how many? Two. Who does he send? Pinchas and Kalev. 
again Kalev, Kalev ben Yifune. Why is name Kalev, Chazal say, Kalev ben Yifune, Kalev kulo lev. Kalev kulo lev. He will give his heart for the truth. And what is Yifune? Shenifna me'atzat me'raglim. Yifune means when he put something aside. He was put aside thanks to his free will to be righteous, not to fall in the trap of the, trap of the spies. So what happened? Now Yoshua knows that Kalev is faithful because he proved himself back then when he had a reason to lie and he didn't do it. I can trust him 100%. Who else were not jealous with me besides Kalev? Kalev was higher than me. He was very happy that I'll become the leader. Who else was higher than me and didn't make a beep? Pinchas. Pinchas, Kohen, Hashem inani, noten lo et briti shalom. Hashem gave him an eternal covenant. Peace. Who got it? Pinchas, the zealous Pinchas to Hashem. Pinchas is a very high level. Naturally, he should have taken the place of Moshe Rabbeinu. Now when Moshe and Aaron are gone, and Nadav and Aviyu are gone, who's the candidate? Pinchas, the biggest tzaddik. Pinchas did not get upset. There is humble. He did not make problems. He did not do what Korach will do next week. Bringing 250 people to, to organize demonstrations against the leader. So Yoshua knew Pinchas can be trusted because he doesn't think about himself. Kalev can be trusted because he doesn't think about himself. Everyone else is questionable. Same thing, these spies were in a very high level, but when it came to their own position, they forgot Hashem, they forgot the Torah, and they forgot the benefit of the Jewish nation. They sold them in a minute. For what? For a job in Congress. I want to be in charge. I want to stay the mayor. But the, but the place is destroyed. I don't care, let the place go on fire. As long as I'm in charge, I'm good. I'm not in charge, there's not going to be a city. You see what's going on today in Israel today? What you see now is a perfect example for what we saw. So Rabotai, Moshe say Latour et Haaretz. You know what Latour means? Tayar. How do you say tourist in, his, in, in Hebrew? Tayar. Latour means tourist, tourism. You, tourist, when he comes to a city, he is looking for the good things in the city or the negative thing. Where does he want to go? If you come to Jerusalem, you want to go to the Kotel, you want to go to holy places, you want to go to Kever David Amelech, you want to go to religious neighborhoods, you want to go to big rabbis. You don't want to go to bad places. If you're a tzaddik tourist, you want to go to good, positive places. What do you do? Take me to the neighborhood with the drugs. Take me to where all the murderers are. Take me to where all the mechalelei Shabbat play soccer on Shabbat in a stadium. What kind of a tourist is that? Latour et Haaretz means go and bring good news. Like tourists, when they come back to their country, they tell all the friends, wow, we had such good time. We went here and we went there and they show pictures of exciting places. But when you send a spy, he doesn't have that agenda to go and enjoy the trip. He has to find the weaknesses of the plane, of the place. Just like Russia, they have spies in every country. In Israel, they have spies sitting in the government. They have over a million Russian and Ukrainian that came to Israel. Who knows how many of them are spies? Only Hashem knows. Who knows? Iranians, they send a lot of, a lot of Persian people came from Iran. All you need is five, ten of them to be Muslim, pretending to be Jews. It's very hard to tell. You know, they speak the same Farsi. How are you going to know? They can have spies in Israel. Or they have so many Arabs in Israel, Hezbollah and Hamas and all of those countries. 
They recruit Arabs online. Every week you hear about a new spy. Al Qaeda, ISIS, people, activists. They have uh, today encrypted WhatsApp, encrypted these things. The Shabak, the security, the security system of Israel cannot detect everything. On social media, they have algorithm. People check how to make a bomb on, uh, on uh, Google. Immediately, they target the person. A person to, uh, speaking about pigua, immediately they check you out. You speak something about gays, they check you out. What's your opinion? If they see you anti-gay, one day before the gay parade, they knock on your door. Hi, open the door. Mize, Shabak, KJB. Ken, what can I do for you? We know that you're planning tomorrow to go and make balagan, to make a mess in a gay parade. We just figure we give you a warning. What do you mean? Now, you know how today everyone takes their phone and begin to film. <laughs> That's the new protection now. Everyone come, immediately puts the phone in his face. Yeah, well, how can I help you? Are you telling me that I cannot go and demonstrate? I'm not telling you what to do. I just suggest, you know, they know how to talk. They teach them legally how to talk. I suggest that you should not show your face there. It's not good for you. What do you mean? You're threatening me? I just told you what's good for you. I'm not threatening you, I'm not telling you what to do. If I would be you, I would make sure not to show up. Sit home, relax. But sometimes if they already see that you're really angry and this abomination, and you already wrote threats on your social media, even in private messages, they don't come with suggestion. They come with punches to your face. Give us your computer, give us your phone. Come with us to the station. Why? They are serving the abomination. I have people that told me, that's what they did to me. Come back after the gay parade, we'll give you back your laptop and your phone. In the meantime, they check what's on your phone, they get information from your laptop, they don't need a warrant. It's not, in America, they pretend to get a warrant. Baloney, they have a judge, hey judge, we need a warrant, it's sufficient? Yeah, you'll have it in five minutes. Baloney. In Israel, they don't even call the judge. They put spyware inside your phone, begin to follow you, no warrant, no nothing. Thousands of people were under surveillance by this lousy police in Israel. No warrants, nothing, no human rights, no nothing. And what do they do? They get private information about people, conversation, money issues, political views, women, pictures, you know, things that can, if they go out, this person will, will, his life will be destroyed. And they blackmail them. Listen, the last thing you want is that your parents will find out that you, you know, you're not straight. The last thing you want that your children will know this and this and that. Do you want the Israeli IRS to find out about the deal you made uh, three years ago? Well, that's how, that's by the way what they do to the politicians. If you realize, in the last two years, a lot of politicians that used to be extreme right became extreme left. Why? Because they work for them. That's what they do. They take someone like Lieberman. Lieberman was like Rabbi Kahana in his opinions. So much anti-Arab, so... Now all of a sudden, and he was very good with the religious uh, leaders, all of a sudden, they probably found something about him that is a bomb. They told him, from now on, you work for us. Overnight, he wants to destroy the religious people. Became the new Haman. Every word, Haredim, Haredim, what happened? Nobody knows. He doesn't even give an answer. He doesn't have a reason. The only reason is they found out something about him, they blackmail him. And he works for them. We will let you continue to have your beautiful fancy car and bodyguards and all kinds of benefits and free flights, business class and budgets. And you decide what to do as long as you work for us, the lefties. 
If you're going to continue to say some of these things you used to say, you'll find yourself very fast behind bar for many years. And all of a sudden, and now you say, okay, you know what, so I want to resign. No, you can't resign. Once you're inside the mafia, you can never leave. You remember the song, Hotel California? You can check out any time, but you can never leave. <laughs> you can check out as much as you want. We'll make sure you're back right there where we want you. That's it. What do you mean? I want to retire. Ah, all of a sudden you want to retire? No, no, no. We need you. By the way, these tricks, it's not only in the Israeli system with the police and all that. These tricks work today all over the world with spies. For instance, if the Israelis will catch a Russian spy in Israel, they will not put him in jail. They will not do any, they can't kill him, they don't kill anyone. I mean, at least on the open, as far as the court, there's no executions. So if it's really, really dangerous, maybe they will have someone to put him out of commission somehow, like the CIA does. But they would prefer to turn him into be a double agent. Meaning, now you're working for us. You gonna give the Russian the information we give you. You tell them that we're about to do this, and this is it, and this is the new thing we develop, and this is the new high tech, and they give them wrong information. Same thing the Russians doing to us, same thing America and Russia and China. China is the best in it, to plant all kinds of fake things all over the world. That's what's happening now. So you cannot believe any politician, because many of them are being blackmailed. Many of them. You don't know the same person that you put your life into support and help him and put him in power. Tomorrow they'll find something in his phone or something with a spy thing that they go, they have a special things. The next day they're going to turn him against you. They sit over there and decide what to do. That's the dirt of the politics. And that's the dirt in everything around. Yeah, 100%. So, Rabotai, now we have an understanding why all of a sudden the spies are going against Hashem. What's going on here? We would not dare to do such thing. Hashem wants to give us the only... By the way, we actually do the same things that the spies did without paying attention. Huh? i give you one example. Bedidi Havavavda. I, myself, thought about it. How many times when you go to Israel and you suffer from the humidity of Tel Aviv area? It's very humid. In, in August, very humid. You complain about the humidity of the Holy Land. That's a sin. Many of us complain about the conditions, complain about certain... Really, in Israel, the land is beautiful. It's a beautiful land. It's nice. It's fun to be there, just to be around. You feel the holiness of the land, you feel it. If there is anything you complain about, is the weather. What else are you gonna complain about? The beauty of the mountains, the, 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 the nice ocean, the unbelievable Jerusalem. There's nothing to complain about. Complaining about the people, the state, the wicked people, the communists, the anti-Torah, oh, it's a different story. You don't complain about the land. You complain about the wicked people, it's something else. That's called the Medina, the state. It has nothing to do with the Holy Land. It's a bunch of communists, anti-Torah, who stole Israel from us, and they dictate to us what to do and what not to do. But the Holy Land is a gift from Hashem. So what happened? Now we go there, and it's very hot and humid sometimes. So what do we do? We complain, wow, it's so hot, I'm dying. That's already a problem. It's Lashon Ara, and Lashon Ara is the truth, you know. When you say Lashon Ara is the truth, like right now I'm dying from heat here and Benji play with his phone. He doesn't get the hint. I'll tell you what, the problem with Benji is he either make the place Siberia or he made it Miami. There's no in between. <laughs> you understand? Either you feel you're in Siberia or you're in why can't we have a normal temperature that everyone will be comfortable? Huh? 
66 is Siberia, Mr. Aronov. Now it's 66? They have to fix the thermostat, because it's very hot now. Anyway, <laughs> the idea, Rabotai, that we do not pay attention and sometimes we complain about the land, and that's a problem. Once you complain about the land that Hashem gave us as a gift, what is the difference between you and the spies? There's only one difference, that the spies did it for personal reasons, you are not doing it because you want anyone not to go there. You yourself maybe suffer. So let's see some other things that I wanted to bring up. Uh, there was one uh, person named Tzlofchad. Tzlofchad? He was the first Mechalel Shabbat in history. Tzlofchad. What happened with him? Moshe asked what to do with him. He was Mekoshesh Etzim. What is Mekoshesh? There are two opinions what it means. One is either that he cut the straw that grows in the ground, he detached it from the roots, which is not allowed on Shabbat. Second opinion is that he was already detached, he just piled them up. Why? You need straw to burn, to put in a fire, to feed the horses, whatever the case is. Also not allowed to make piles on Shabbat. It's called me'amer. Omer means a pile of, of wheat or barley or whatever you use right now. Either way, it's Chilul Shabbat. Everyone knew that he's supposed to die. Because in the Torah, they already knew that Mechalel Shabbat must be put to death. But they didn't know yet what form of death, what method to use. Because there are four different kinds of execution. Burning, stoning, sword, and choking. When it's not mentioned in the Torah how the execution has to be, what's the most common execution, who knows? Chenek. Choking. If it says clearly burning, then it's burning. If it says that means stoning. So the Torah is specific about four different kinds of execution. Who gets execution? I'll give you a list of people. Mechalele Shabbat, idol worshippers, gays, people, men and men, not women and women. Women and women, it's seen in the Torah, just like eating chazir, but there's no death penalty. There are a list of many, many sins in the Torah that have death penalty. The Torah say yumat, mot yumat, all these things. I have lectures about it over the years. If you want, you can go and check there. Also the Yisurei Karet, many of the sex crimes is death penalty. So, Moshe did not know Mechalel Shabbat what kind of execution he will get. He knew that he has to be put to death because everybody knew about the importance of Shabbat, but he didn't know how. So Moshe didn't know what to do. Hashem said, Moshe put him in jail. He put him in a dungeon. What's jail? You have a hole in the ground and you let the person go in with a ladder and once he goes there, you pick up the ladder and he cannot do anything, and there are guards on top. That's the jails of those days. Not like today, they have uh, bunk beds, air condition, plasma television, watching lectures about religion. In Israel, in a jail, eating chulent. The, the jail was different back then. You put someone in a hole and that's it. Sometimes it can be very deep hole, dark, you can see the sun. So what happened, Moshe knows that he has to execute Tzlofchad, but he doesn't know how. And then when Hashem came and said, execute him, by stoning. And that's the first Mechalel Shabbat in the history of the world. And why did he break Shabbat? 
Not because he was wicked. Not because he wanted to drive to the beach or to the pool. Or to go to the stadium and watch a football game. No. He decided to sacrifice his life for the sake of the public. That they should see in their own eyes what punishment Hashem said to give to a Mechalel Shabbat. So he didn't even need to pile the straw. <laughs> when, we do, when we break Shabbat, there has to be a reason for it. Money, convenience, all kinds of things. Why a person is Mechalel Shabbat? Assuming he knows what Shabbat. And he knows what he does right now is forbidden. Why will he do it? For money reason, for convenience, to save time, to, sh to save embarrassment, for all kinds of things. Over here, he doesn't get anything. He doesn't need a straw, he doesn't need to cut it on Shabbat, and he does, definitely doesn't need to make piles on Shabbat. Why did he do it? That two witnesses would come and warn him, and he got the warning and continued to do it. And then they reported him. And now they're going to execute him for everybody to see the death of a Mechalel Shabbat. Someone like that, if you be the judge in a court, would you give him a death penalty? I would give him a warning. Say, please, I know you meant well, but that's the last time you do such thing. We don't need to teach the Jewish public how to be righteous or not to be wicked by committing sins. That's not what Hashem wants. There's nowhere in the Torah that you have permission to be wicked for people to see what's the end of the wicked. No, there's no such thing. Very well, you meant well, you love Hashem, you care about Shabbat, but you should have not done it. Next time you do it, I have no choice but to execute you. Fair enough or no? Fair enough or no? I'm a good judge or no? Apparently not. Because Hashem thought he deserved a different punishment. What was the punishment he got? Stoning. Veragmu to kol ha'eda ba'avanim. Horrible death. Now, Abotai, I have to ask you a question. What Slofcha did is affecting us today or no? That was 3,300 years ago. It's affecting us today? Today. Us sitting here in Queens listening to Divrei Torah. With or without him, we read in the Torah that Mechalel Shabbat is death by stoning and a permanent cut for the soul in the afterlife. We needed Slofcha to tell us how to behave and not now to behave? No. Maybe the people of his generation had made an impact on them after seeing such a horrible execution. I'm sure anyone who thought ever to be Mechalel Shabbat will never dare to try. You agree or no? After seeing such thing, okay, okay, we got it. Got it. That's why in Singapore, nobody distributed drugs on the street. No one smoked drugs in the street. And no one kissed his, girl, his girlfriend on the street. And no one draw graffiti, graf, graffiti, on, uh, graffiti on the walls. Because it can be either they hit you with a whip in public or they execute you. When you land in Singapore, they give you a note. Welcome to the land that for using drugs or distributing drugs, you will get the death penalty. And a year ago, they actually killed an autistic person. Partially autistic. They argue to the end. The whole world was against them. How can you execute someone with such a low IQ? He's not responsible for his actions. They brought few proofs from his life that he can tell the difference between good and bad when he really wants and executed him. No discounts whatsoever. That's why there's no crime there. You don't have crime in Singapore. Nothing. No crime. You don't have gangs. You don't have to be worried at 2 a.m. when you go to places. You're not afraid someone will blow your head off with a gun or someone in a subway will look at you and he doesn't like how you look at him and he's going to start shooting at you. You don't have all these things. Why? No one dared to. In Saudi Arabia, people would think a million times before they steal. They chop their head off. 
Imagine life without a hand. Then chop your hands. People are afraid. In Iran, same thing. Gays. I'm sure there are gays in Iran. Would they dare to walk on the street holding hands like they do here in Manhattan? If they'll do it in Iran, in less than an hour, they'll be both hanged on a lift 300 feet high for a week. They leave them in the middle of Tehran and people walk and see them hanging. That's why nobody dare to make demonstration, Pride Month, all kinds of stupid rainbow colors everywhere. You don't have it in these countries. You want to do what you want to do, you do it in your own house. You don't brainwash our children with your nonsense. Countries like that have strong judgment system. Yes, I know what you're going to say. Yeah, but they don't have human rights. I agree. People have to have human rights. The Torah wants to give human rights, but the Torah also gives punishment. One does not come on the expense of the other. Before you execute a person, you have to know one million percent that it's him. If there is a tiny doubt of less than one percent, you can execute him. In case you thought, wow, the Torah is so cruel. Just because someone smokes a cigarette on Shabbat, they're going to execute him? The answer is no. They hardly ever executed anyone. Slofchad is one of the only few people in the last 30, 300 years that was executed. The Gemara say a cruel Sanhedrin executed one person per seven years. A merciful Sanhedrin never executed anyone. And most Sanhedrins were very merciful. Why the rabbis would want to execute any wicked people? Leave it to Hashem. In the end, anyone gets what they deserve in the end. So why should we execute? So what did they do, the Gemara say? They did everything they can to find contradiction between the two witnesses. Hundreds of questions. Until one question, they didn't answer 100% correctly. Such as, where was the Chilul Shabbat? Under the tree. Which tree? The pomegranate tree. What was the size of the pomegranate? What does it have to do with the Chilul Shabbat? I'm telling you, you'll eat a cigarette under the tree. Do you think I paid attention to the size of the fruit? Answer the question. One say large. One say mediocre. Oh, contradiction. What does the contradiction have to do with the crime? Zero, zero connection. But the Torah say, if there are contradictions, you cannot execute a person. We play dumb. You didn't say exactly like him, you can go. And put him in jail, you can do other things. But they don't want to execute anyone. Why? One guy once asked me in Israel, wait a minute, so something doesn't make sense here. What is the purpose of giving punishments in a Torah? To scare people. Why did Hashem give stoning, death by stoning? Why did he give choking and burning and all these execution? To make people think a million times before they commit the crime, no? Why every country give severe punishments? In America, they're very strict with drugs. Those big drugs, drug dealers, they go to jail 30, 40 years sometimes. Terrible. On a murder, they don't give such a punishment like a drug dealer. So the question is, Every country is sensitive to a specific crime, or few of them. Depend on the country. Like in Uganda, they execute gays. They just pass the law. They don't care about America, say, so we're going to cut you out. You're going to suffer, you're going to lose billions of dollars of aid. We're going to block you away from the banking system. We're going to take sanctions against you. You don't tell us how to raise our people. We don't want abomination in Uganda. It's against the law. Someone will be caught. They will be executed. Unbelievable. The only country in the world that declared it, vote for it in their parliament, and the vast majority was for it. There's no liberals there. They don't have educated Jews from Harvard over there, or from Colombia or Yale. Bunch of goyim, Africans. They didn't stand in Muhammad al Sinai, they didn't have the laws of God, but they follow the laws of God. Every other word is the Torah, the God, 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 God. It drives the American crazy. Why well, you keep saying God, God, God? Forget about God. God used to be. Now it's a different world. We the liberals make the new rules. No, no, no. 
But we, we, are, we will fight you. We're not afraid of you. Do you know that that's a big threat? You don't want to become an enemy of the United States. They will have revenge against you. They didn't care. We trust God. He will give us what we deserve. I was shocked when I saw it. Wow. One country has the guts to stand and tell the United States we can care less about your help and about your threats. We will pass our own rules over here. The whole world, the Europeans, they all go crazy. So Abotai, so one guy asked me in Israel, so if that's the case, and they never executed Mechalalei Shabbat, according to what you say that it's mentioned in the Talmud, you actually defeat the purpose. The whole purpose of these executions was to scare the people. If one time in the 30 years you execute one criminal, one murderer, murder it's a, it's a death penalty. One person murder, you make a, an example out of him. All the people who think to murder someone they don't like, they will never dare after they saw what happened to this guy. If you dismiss the murder by finding contradiction between the witnesses, you're basically going against God's will. Very good question he asked, no? What do you think? Good question or no? Brilliant question. What was the purpose of the punishment that Hashem gave in the Torah? Revenge? No. It's more to get us to think before we do something stupid. Why in uh, Singapore they give you such a warning? They hope you will never touch drugs and never sell their children drugs. They don't want that the tourist that comes from America will become a burden for them that they have to kill him. That's the last thing they want. But they have to be strict. That's why nobody dare to do what the people do over here every second. So, fear from the punishment works very well. It prevents a large portion of the crimes in society. The people are more decent. Even if they're not decent, at least they don't act against decency in public. Whatever they do, they'll do in hidden places. That's already an achievement. If someone is a psycho, let him be a psycho in his own bedroom. Why do I need him next to my children in the middle of the street? When they go to the synagogue, they have to see the psycho walk naked on the street with his mental disease? No. You want to do it, do it in your home. Why do you have to go in front of the whole, of the whole world and convince them that that's normal? Go and tell people what I just say. <laughs> They'll look at you like you're not normal. Because they don't, they don't care about the book of God, they don't care about the existence of God, and they can care less what he thinks about them. That's really the situation right now. So the answer to this guy that asked me that question, I gave it to him and he actually accepted the answer. I said, no one will execute you. He was Mechalel Shabbat at that time. Baruch Hashem, not anymore after that. Huh? So I said to him, no, I gave him a different answer. I said to him, if there was Sanhedrin, they wouldn't execute you now. You get a warning, you will get to the trial, they will find a contradiction between the witnesses and send you back home. But, when you read in the book of God that he said that a Jew that rebelled against him and break the covenant with no shame, the covenant of Shabbat, which is the foundation of the entire Torah, it was given to us before the Torah was given to show you the importance of Shabbat. And the Torah said that if you don't, you're not Shomer Shabbat, you're not even Jewish. That's, that's the law of the Torah. How many times you hear it out, out there, people are afraid to say it. But that's the law in Shulchan Aruch in seven different places. Seven times it's mentioned in Shulchan Aruch. The Jewish book of law. So if a person is not keeping Shabbat, you need two conditions to be Jewish, that your mother is Jewish from birth, or a convert, real convert, send you born to a convert, you're Jew. You're born to a Jew from birth, from birth, you're Jew. But you need one more condition, it's not enough. You need to be Shomer Shabbat, Jewish mother and Shomer Shabbat. You have Jewish mother and not Shomer Shabbat, you're excluded from Judaism. 
You shomer Shabbat, but your mother is not Jewish, you're not a Jew. You need these two testimonies in you all the time. Your mother is Jewish and you are Shomer Shabbat. Your mother is Jewish, everyone knows. Not everyone agree with that, but everyone knows these rules. Everybody in the world knows that if your mother is Jewish, you're Jewish. But if you mechalel Shabbat, you're not a Jew, 99.9% .9 of the people do not know. Why? Because every speaker is afraid to mention it. Why does he need a headache? They say I'm an extremist. They say I'm crazy. You're questioning my Judaism? Who are you to decide? I decide, Hashem decide. What do you say in the Kiddush? Mechaleleah, those who make Shabbat a weekday, regular weekday, mot, yumat, will be put to death in this world, younger, and will be put to death in the eternal world. Venichreta anefeshai me'amea. And that soul is cut from the Jewish nation. It's a verse in the Torah. Twelve times. It repeats in the Torah, 12 times. Right there, you see, the Mechalel Shabbat is 100% a goy. How about the Brit Milah? Brit Milah, it's considered Arel. A person needs to do Brit Milah. But sometimes he's sick, he cannot have Brit Milah. His brother did and he died. Another brother died. A person doesn't have Brit Milah, he's still a Jew. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, Avraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov. Three Jewish kids. Avraham, they did to him Brit Milah, passed. Yitzchak, they did Brit Milah, passed. They have problem with vitamin K in the blood. The blood is not clogged. They, the baby lost enough blood and died. Yaakov, they're not allowed to do Brit Milah. After Avram and Yitzchak passed, Yaakov, they cannot do Brit Milah. His mother is Jewish and he's Shomer Shabbat, he's a Jew. Why? He's a nus. So listen to this. So I say to this guy in Israel, Look at yourself in a mirror and remember what the Torah says about you. That in the opinion of God, you should have now put to death in the most horrible way possible. That people will blow your head off with, with rocks the size of a melon. And you will be broken to 5,000 pieces on the floor. Your whole skeleton and skull, every, everything will be broken to thousands of pieces. Do you know what it means? That people throw thousands of rocks at your head? That's what Hashem said to do to you if you mechalel Shabbat. No one will ever do it to you. Don't worry. It will never materialize into reality. But just for the fact that the creator of the world that supplies you with oxygen and health and children and money and who knows what else. Say that you are so despicable that that's what should have happened to you. For one time you break Shabbat. Forget about routinely. One time on purpose. One time. That's enough. That's it. And see if you can go on with your life like nothing happened. And he was so ashamed that after that Baruch Hashem became Shomer Shabbat. It doesn't have to really be. We're not, we're not looking for revenge. We're not here to hurt people just because they're wicked. No. Hashem decides what he wants to do with people. We, we prefer not to punish anyone. We want them to repent. But we want to see people suffer? No. No. I get all the time, almost every day, almost every day, minimum one email of someone, usually it's anonymous because people are embarrassed, that asked me for forgiveness for speaking Lashonara about me in the past. Sometimes they wake up, maybe they learn the laws of Lashonara, or maybe they hear a good lecture of mine, or someone send them a video. They regret what they did in the past, and now they apologize. Immediately I answer, I forgive. Don't even ask what it was, what did you say, what kind of damage you caused me, nothing. Why? I don't want any, any Jew to go to hell because of what he, he did to me. What well, he did, it's between him and Hashem. I definitely don't want to see anyone suffer. But the people that fight the Torah, forget me, Torah, they want to destroy the Torah, they want to spread abomination, they want to destroy Judaism, they want to turn Israel into a state of anti-God people. All these liberals, I can't stand them. I can't look at them. I can't stand in the same room with them. And that's the obligation from the Torah. It's not even my choice. You want to be righteous? 
you have to despite all the wicked people. Not for personal reasons. Not because something he said to me or did to me or stole money from me. That's a different story. When it's personal, be easy to forgive. But when a person wants to turn Israel to a country of mentally sick children, every other child, they want to change his, his sex, transgender everywhere. Now they want to pass a law in Israel that the teachers do not have to tell their parents that the little kids wants to change their sex. Can you believe it? You send the kids to public school in Israel, six, seven years old, and they brainwash him with all the cartoon and the stupid things, and they bring transgender into the class to talk about what they do. And then they say, wow, you have to be like this. It's great. You have to be open-minded. Don't be primitive. Don't be like your parents. Be careful from religion. And what happened? The kid that doesn't know anything from his life, the kid that doesn't know anything from his life, what happened in the end? All of a sudden he say, I feel that I'm a girl. I want to become a girl or I want to become a boy. Until now, they had to call the parents and tell them, your child decided to be something else. Now they don't have to. For the sake of protecting the child, you listen to this? For the sake of protecting the child, they don't have to tell the parents anything. Meaning, they officially kidnap your children in the public schools in Israel. I don't know in America, but in Israel. Yeah. Huh? In America also? <laughs> Maybe they learn it from here, I don't know. I just want to finish because I have to run. Give me three more minutes and we're done. Tzlofchad never ever dream about the impact that he's going to make on the Jewish world. If he knew it, he will never dare to do what he did. Now I'm going to tell you how Tzlofchad does affect every one of us today. Affect every Jew in history affect all the tragedies that happened to the Jewish people. No one caused more harm to the Jewish nation than this poor Tzlofchad, who was willing to sacrifice his life for Hashem. Theoretically, no one is a tzaddik like him. How many people willing to die for Hashem? One out of a million, not even. Theoretically, we have to kiss his feet. Practically, it destroyed our nation. You're wondering, what am I talking about? Let me tell you what. Tzlofrat ben Hefer. This Gemara speaks about him in Baba Batra Kuf Yutet, 119. So Rabotai... When Slofrad passed, he goes up to the court of heaven. And the angel asks him, where are you planning to be? He said, in heaven. I, I gave my life for the sake of heaven. For Kedushat of Shabbat. That people will be scared not to break Shabbat. The angel say, oh yeah, yeah, you really deserve heaven. But before that, I want to show you a movie. I'll make you a tea, Persian tea, or Bukharian tea, whatever you prefer, Chinese tea. You tell me what flavor you want in your tea, and I would like you to watch this film, 3D. You know these glasses? I want to show you what happened because of what you did. You ready? Slofrad is sitting. What does he see? The Holocaust. Children are being burned. Women executed, men, horrible things, gas chambers, people are choked, millionaires and billionaires turns overnight to homeless people, putting them in cages, six in a little bed. What is, what is this? What are you showing me this? Wait, wait. They show him Siberia. How many Jews walk on ice with no shoes? How their eyes are purple, their legs are purple. They don't feel anything. You know, when you're on the ice for days, they see people are dying on the sides of the road in a death march. 
they show him the pogroms, they show him all the children, all the Zionist heretics, communists that destroyed Israel and turned it into a nation of goyim, when almost no Torah, they fight Torah with such hatred. So what are you showing me all this? Oh, Eve, why are you showing me all this? The angel says, it's hard for you to watch this. Yes, I can't take it, I'm dying. Why are you showing it to me? I'm, I'm very, I'm suffering, please stop. They show him the Inquisition, how they tortured the Jews, the Christians in Spain and Portugal 500 years ago. They show him Khomeini in Iran. They show him Hezbollah. They show him Iran building a bomb to destroy us. They show him Hamas, rockets falling in Tel Aviv, Israel. They show him all the abomination parades. He's now, by now, open, open your eyes, don't close your eyes. Watch! They show him now millions of people burning in hell, screaming, no, no mercy. What is that to do with me? Keep asking. The angel said, patience. After the movie end, when Slovchad is basically mentally finished, destroyed, the angel said to him, if the nation of Israel would keep two Shabbatot, the salvation immediately would come. That's what the Gemara says. They kept the first Shabbat, and the second Shabbat you messed up. Because of what you did, the salvation didn't come, and the Messiah didn't arrive back then. And 3,300 years of all the suffering the Jewish people had to go through, all goes to your file and to your account. You're responsible for everything. But imagine the shock he gets now. Ma, I did for the sake of heaven. The way to hell is full of good intentions. When you're an ignorant fool and you don't learn Torah and you don't have a rabbi and you think you know everything, and you act based on your hunch or what your stupid friends told you and you make fun of the real rabbis who teach the truth because you're liberal from university and you think you minimum another god just because you're some kind of a doctor or a lawyer or who knows what else so you don't care about what the chief rabbis say and you don't care about anything. Everything by you is science and academic and vaccine and now and anti. I don't care what the rabbis say. We know better. We went to university. You're one of those. So they sold him in Shamaim. Kavanatcha achen aita retsuya. Your intention were good. You had good intention. But why didn't you go to Moshe Rabbeinu to ask him if you should do what you did? You have a rabbi that speaks to Hashem almost every day. You would come to Moshe, Moshe, I want to give my life for the Kiddush Hashem. What do you want to do? I want to do Chilul Shabbat, and I want you to execute me. Like this, we save thousands of other people that are planning to break Shabbat. Moshe would say to him in our loud, it's against the Torah. It would serve a great purpose, but it's not allowed. Hashem doesn't need us to commit sins to improve the future. That's not the way of the Torah. Moshe would tell him, very nice, your intentions are very good, but you're not allowed to materialize them into action, and you're going to get the reward for being a person who is willing to die for Hashem and for the Shabbat. That's it. You will get your reward, but you don't have to die. And the same thing can be told today. A lot of people did things and they didn't ask the rabbi. If the prime minister of Israel would say that he's about to join the Muslim brother and give him 54 billion shekel and go against everything he ever promised in public before the election, one rabbi in the world would agree to approve such thing? Even the most liberal Zionist rabbi will never agree such thing. No one would agree such thing. You would ask this rabbi and that one, Sfaradi, Ashkenazi, Hasid, Dati Leumi. Even reform rabbis wouldn't agree, if you can call them rabbis. 
Many of them wouldn't agree. But they do whatever they want, they don't ask. I should ask a rabbi. Not only they don't ask a rabbi, they sue a rabbi in a secular court. And just show you what they think about rabbis. Why didn't you go to Moshe, or to Aaron, or to the 70 elders? There are so many wise people, they could have given you the right answer before you did what you did. So Tzlofchad, unfortunately, poor guy, got the shock of his life. Many of us are this Tzlofchad in a smaller format. In a smaller format. I'll give you one example. A person met a beautiful Goya, very pretty, with a heart of gold. German Goya. Fell in love with her in a kibbutz. His friends were begging him. No, it's against the Torah, but she's great. Okay, we're not asking, we're not questioning her greatness. It's against God. God said it doesn't matter. Good Gentile, bad Gentile, it's not relevant. Intermarriage is not, not allowed. It destroys the future of my nation. I don't allow it. But every Jewish girl I dated, she wants this and she wants, uh, I don't know, $50,000 flowers in her wedding and a house in Great Neck and five, uh, five carat diamond and a Mercedes uh, SUV and this Amiga Spanish, she told me, put me in a basement, give me peanut butter with the American cheese, I'm happy, as long as you take me. Senor, please, por favor. He has very convincing points. He's not lying. He dated this girl, it's three minimum a million dollars to marry her. The other one, 800,000. The other one, five million. Then came Sylvia. Como esta, senor? Oh, que pasa? What do you want? I don't need a ring. Give me, I don't know, cubic zirconia. <laughs> no, no, por favor, no, nah, no. No problem, just take me, take me. That's it, you sure? Yeah. Do you want a car? A car? I'm very happy with the subway. Wow, how did I find this angel? What happened? He wants to marry her. The rabbi said it's not allowed, it's against the Torah. I'm sorry. I'm not going to marry a, a Jap. If you know what Jap means. I want to marry Sylvia. Okay, Rabbi, you give me hard time. Okay, so convert her. She will keep mitzvot. Everything I tell her she does. She'll die for me. Look. Sylvia, you're going to be Shomer Shabbat. Whatever it is, I'll do. You do this, you do that. Absolutely. But there's a problem, you're a Kohen, you can't marry a convert. Oh, Rabbi, you're annoying. Okay, I marry her anyway. He married her, and who was born? Adolf Hitler. <laughs> and then he killed six million people, or 50 million people he actually killed, and destroyed the world. They said that he had Jewish blood. If you check his uh, biography, whatever they published, as much as you can count on it or not, I don't know. But it's very realistic, very realistic, that you're gonna have a child from some Goya, and he's a Goy, and he's gonna be a huge anti-Semite, and he's gonna become a monster. And next thing, he's gonna go against his own people. Look at Bernie Sanders. If Bernie Sanders would, Sanders would be the president of the United States, most likely wouldn't be here now. He would do everything he can to eliminate us. Every Jew, every religious Jew, he would fight us to the end. I don't say he would put us in gas chambers, but he would do everything he can to help the Hamas to kill us. <coughs> he declares it every interview. Every. And if he has a child that learned from his father and is more aggressive, and is a fan of some other anti-Semite, tomorrow he's gonna perform some kind of a pogrom or holocaust or who knows what else. Who's gonna pay for all the, the, the suffering? One decision, but she was a great girl. She was. She had such a good heart. She was. But you don't ask the rabbi. You don't ask what the Torah say. Why you don't ask? Because you're afraid of the answer. You don't want to hear the truth. 
a woman that wants to buy a, a wig all the way to the floor. She comes first to a rabbi to ask if it's kosher. One out of a thousand maybe does it. No, it's not kosher. Oh, Rabbi, you broke my heart. Oh, I love this wig. Tov, what can I do? You say it's not kosher, so cut it from here. Rabbi, it's the whole thing. I'm sorry, it has to be very short. And that's also questionable, because many big rabbanim are totally against it. You want to do it, at least do it according to that rabbi, and that rabbi has to be short. And Life is all a fight between the brain and the heart. Every minute of your life. Analyze your life. To come to shiur or not, it's a fight between the brain and the heart. The heart say, watch a movie now, stay home, sit in a jacuzzi, drink cold beer, lechaim, there's parties by your friend, birthday party. And the brain say, what, what is it going to give you? Come, sit two, three hours, learn Torah, enjoy, inspire. Everything in life is a, is a fight between the brain and the heart. To go to Miami or not to go? What the brain say of Ben Torah? Don't dare to go. What does the heart say? Mitzvah. You need to refresh. Soon you have to go back to the yeshiva, Ben Azmanim, enjoy a little bit. Get a video, Yetzirara. You want to buy a car? The brain say, buy a little Toyota. Toyota Camry. Doesn't attract too much attention. No one eye will be on you. What does the stomach say, the, the heart? Come on, you're an important rabbi. Avovadi Yosef was driven by a Mercedes. You are just as influential in the world. Get yourself also one like that. And make sure you get a driver also. And when people open their mouth, you're going to know what to say. <laughs> There's always a fight between the brain and the heart. And the heart will always give you the wrong advice. Always. Always. Even when you have mercy on a person, most likely it's against Hashem's will. Against Hashem's will. Today we had a Rosh Chodesh thing. In, uh, we do it every Rosh Chodesh. A big event with guitar, a beautiful meal. Today I was in the Alpine Marina. You sit by the boat there, and one guy, long beard like this. We talked about, you know, the Vre Torah a little bit. And he was trying to convince me that you have to love the wicked people. And I said to him, it's against the halacha. And I started to give him proofs. No matter how many proofs I gave him, I saw in his body language that he's suffering. Why? Because he's brainwashed that you have to love the people that fight God. That's how they educated him, his heretic teachers. If they only knew what the halacha is, they wouldn't teach people to love the people that spit at Hashem every day. If you love them, you're going to be severely punished. Severely punished for that. You don't believe me? Don't have to believe me. Open Orchot Sadikim, chapter 24, and read. A few pages there. Then come back to me and tell me if I'm right or wrong. It's the most important Musar book in Jewish history. It was written a thousand years ago. All the Musar we know, it's from this book, <laughs> Way of the Righteous. I made a whole series about it. Chapter 24, Shara Hanufa. Read over there who you're allowed to admire, who you're allowed to love, who you're allowed to kiss up to, who you're allowed to compliment. You'll be shocked. You will be completely shocked. How foolish you were until today. And thinking you're such a Haredi Tzadik. You'll find out that there's not a day in your life that you didn't get Hashem angry with your ignorant ideology. And you know what? I know it's not your fault. Speakers that speak this nonsense all over, especially here in America, all these liberal university rabbis, they destroy the world. That's why I made a blacklist who you should not listen to. That's why I so many times warn people, you got to be very careful. People say, who should we listen to? Listen to Rabbi Victor Miller. You always be safe. There's nothing to worry about. Every word who ever came out of his mouth is holy, divine. Divine. You never find one time he gave an answer that is not Hashem's opinion. Never. No problem. Here you go. You have who to listen to. There are plenty of books. There are tapes. There are old tapes. Plus, there are some good speakers who still left in today's generation. 
who follow his Ashkafa. There are. Not as many as it used to be, but there are. The stipler, the father of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, 50 years ago, said that the speakers that we used to have are gone. We no longer have them. That was 50 years ago. And the level of the speakers in his time was about a thousand times better than today. People tell me, oh, you're strict, you this, fanatic. If I was in a time of the stipler, they'll give me a kick all the way from here to Zimbabwe. They'll call me kofer. They'll call me blah, blah, blah. Ma. I would be reform in their eyes. And today, oh, it's so extreme. I'm not extreme. You're just so ignorant that you don't even know what the Torah is. So you think I'm such a, I'm making up some extreme rules. Sometimes I show people in the Rambam what I say, well, they get the shock of their life. And they begin. How do we twist the words of the Rambam? Because how, how can we accept such a thing? It's against what we learn in the university. That's the truth. Not I'm, I'm coming to break here. I'm nothing now and definitely was nothing 50 years ago. You know, in Agmara, they say since Rebbe passed, there's no more humble people. One of the Chachamim got up and said, I'm alive. <laughs> Do you know one normal rabbi today that his rabbi in a yeshiva would say, there's no more humble people? And he get up and say, Rabbi, I'm humble. <laughs> right away, you know, you're the biggest proud person here. Right or wrong? This was 2,000 years ago. Do you know how holy these people were? No, so how do you explain that? You see, what you think that you understand, you sometimes don't understand. He said, in today's world, how can it be that people waste time listening to me and learning Torah from me? That's what he said. He was so humble that he said, no, I don't know why people coming to me to ask me questions or to listen to me. I mean, I mean I'm nothing. It's a joke. I feel so embarrassed that they even ask me. If he lived today, it would be better than all the rabbis in the world combined. But he felt that he's not even worthy of people wasting time listening to him. When people used to come to Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul, the biggest Chacham in the world, the biggest Sadiq, one of the top, he said, why are you coming to me? Go to Chacham of Adia. Are you less? No. He thought he's nothing. No, no, go to Chacham of Adia. Why are you asking me? <laughs> Rabbi, it's a simple question. No, no. We have to go to the Mara de Atra. When he went to Daven together with Rav Ovadia in Panama, they went on a trip to Panama. He didn't put two tefillin like the Kabbalists, like he does every day. He put one after the other. They asked him, Rama, you always put two tefillin together. You Kabbalist. Why you now put one? Say, Rav Ovadia is here. He, he said that you have to put one at a time, not two together. How can I go against the chief rabbi in his face? But, but you also a chief rabbi. <laughs> your, your opinion is not less. I'm nothing. You get the point or no? Rabbi say, ah, look at me. I'm a proof that there are still humble people. Why would they waste time on me? They come to learn Torah by me? That means <laughs> there's, there's a lot of humble people. If they're willing to, to, learn, to listen, to waste time on someone like me, there's a lot of humble people. Right, if you have a 20 years old student in yeshiva and he's giving a shiur and top five rabbis in, in Israel coming now to listen to him. He's 90, he's 95, he's 85. They see it and they enjoy the Gemara he explained. They know it by, by their eyes closed in the middle of the night. What are they doing in a shiur? Humility. They're not getting up and leaving in the middle. Why? They enjoy. I had a few times like this. And I went, I spoke in big yeshivot in Israel. There was some big chachamim there in yeshivot. Sit and enjoy. Oh, the whole Torah they know by heart. And they sit and enjoy. Like, oh, some gdolador came to speak. The humility of the people. Who is he? Who, uh, by humble people it doesn't exist. 
As long as you speak the truth without heresy. If you're going to say heresy, they're going to stop you right there. Because there's no tolerance to modify the truth of God. And today, unfortunately, there's unlimited amount of tolerance to heretics and infidels. Unlimited amount of tolerance. And I'm telling you, it's not an exaggeration. Everyone who listens to heretics will be punished severely for every minute. And all this Torah goes to the Satan. All goes to the Sitra Achra. It doesn't go to your account as learning Torah. It's going to the Satan as destroying the world. Listening to all these heretics in my list and many others. Listening to them, it's a sin. For them, and for you. They are Mahti Arabim. So they have plenty of sins. The more people listen to them, the more punishment they're going to get. But you also will be punished for listening to them. Why? You have to ask. Ask your rabbi, can I, can I listen to this? We have one Ashkenazi rabbi in yeshiva. Big Talmid Chacham. And I finish my mash right here. Big Talmid Chacham. There was one guy in Yeshiva, I don't know if you remember, I told you the story, a, a, a new guy just showed up and came with a book of Santa Claus. I seen a whole Yeshiva, 40 years a whole Yeshiva, never one person brought a book of heresy into the Yeshiva. I see on the table, I said, whose, whose book is this? He doesn't know anything from his life, he just came. You're not allowed to read this book, get it out of the Yeshiva immediately. Started to argue, so get it out before we throw you with the book together. So in the end, you know, he started to go to cry to here, to there, but they told him, if he told you it's heresy, it's heresy, don't argue. So what did he do? He saw that all the Sfaradim, they told him it's heresy, heresy, heresy. So he went to this Ashkenazi Rav and told him what he read over there. Oh man, yeah, listen, it's problematic, but this, but this, and many of the things are Chabad, they're all like this. He was trying to cover it, you know, in a way. So one person told me, listen, maybe it's not so bad like you think. <laughs> I sent him a list and the film that Rabbi Ephraim Kachlon made, but he read the whole book and started to read from the book and explain this. The next day, that Ashkenazi rabbi said, I never saw in my life such a heresy. But it's not just a heresy. It's a declaration of war against Hashem. It's higher than heresy. Heresy means I accept what Hashem say, but I have observations. This I disagree, this I disagree. This should be like this, this should be like that. But here is, we don't need you. You're not going to tell us what to do. We didn't, we didn't ask to be born. You have no right to judge us. 2,000 years we go through suffering. Who are you to tell us now that we have to repent? That's what this book is about. You will never find one Muslim teacher that will dare to write such thing, or a Christian, or any other fake religion. Why? Every fool knows that that's a declaration of war against Hashem. The idea is not just God needs me, he's a needy, poor God, he's bored, he suffered, he was lonely, he needed us, he's playing with us, with our emotions, rewarding and punishing us. That's not the idea. It's what's behind it. Therefore, that's the main thing that they hide. Because he needed us, because he's miserable, because he's lonely, because he made us, because we didn't ask to be here, he has no right to tell us what to do. Meaning, take the Torah and put it in the toilet. We are not obligated for this Torah. That's why we don't believe in punishment and we deny that hell exists. That's not just heresy. That's not a, in the Gemara there are people who believed in everything in the Torah, but they had few observations. The Chachamim put them on a ban. Tzdukim. They were arguing about the meaning of the verses in the Torah, and they are very convincing. Real arguments. And the Chachamim called them Tzdukim, Baitusim, all kinds of names. And they put them in Cherem. Nobody is allowed to learn by them or to quote them or anything. If they live today, this Tzdukim will get a heart attack if they see his book. The Tzdukim that are memorized in history as heretics, they are a billion times more accurate in their ideology than this Reshaim in my blacklist. 
guitar a million times worse. And they have fans on YouTube. It breaks my heart to see all these fans where they're going. They think they learned Torah, they don't know what's waiting for them. Because there's nothing Hashem hates more than Avodah Zarah and heresy and Kofrim. You see, read in the Torah. Korach just argue about Moshe giving a job to his brother Aaron. Korach was one of the people who carried the Aaron HaKodesh. From Shevet Levi, important, important person. What happened to him? Got buried alive. Until today, 3,300 years, everyone used him as a perfect example of a Rasha. Everyone, Rasha, Korach, Korach, Machloket. One incident, finished for eternity. They, a billion times worse than Korach. Not million, a billion times worse than Korach. What happened to the followers of Korach? They went where he went. What happened to the followers of these heretics? They will go where they go. Especially those who heard me warning about it, or Rabbi Aaron Ruven and few others who warned about it, and ignored the warning and made fun. They only buried themselves even deeper. I know I'm saying some hard words here, but that's the truth. It's my obligation to warn. If you listen or not, it's on you. That's what the Prophet Yechezkel said, Vataki is Arta Rasha, if you warn the wicked, and he repented. He saved himself from death, and you saved your soul. If you warn him, and he did not repent, and continue with his wicked way, he will die for his sins, and you will be saved because you warn him. That's called rebuke. You have to rebuke. You rebuke a few times, the person gets angry, leave him alone. As long as he listens and argue, continue to rebuke. Once he doesn't listen anymore, leave me alone, don't talk to me about it, I'm not interested. Okay, I warn you enough, you don't want to listen, you own your own. That's what the Torah is all about. And I have a whole lecture. It's mitzvah in the Torah and it's an obligation to be judgmental. It's not America, oh, you're so judgmental. Of course I'm judgmental. The Torah forced me to be judgmental. And I see a person dressed like a clown, naked on the street. I have to be judgmental. I have to warn my kids not to be next to him. If I see a drug addict who wants to come play with my kids, I have to be judgmental not to let him in. Or all kinds of other cycles. If my friend is about to marry a girl that she's the biggest putza in town, I have to be judgmental and warn him before he's going to end in a horrible place with her. Every person you see on the street, you see a person that looks like a real dangerous murderer on the street. Gives you a look, some antisemite. You run quickly. Why you run? Because you're judgmental. <laughs> you have the right to be judgmental. Because if these kind of people, whatever they are, white, black, Chinese, doesn't matter, Arabs, in this particular place people behave in a certain way, Statistics show people get killed there for nothing, ever, again and again and again. Or up people, or it's dangerous areas. You get there, you usually don't come there alive. You have to be judgmental. If you see one of them next to you, you have to be nervous. You have to be prepared with your pepper uh, spray. Why, you, why your hand is on a pepper swear 2 a.m. In, in a subway when you see someone walks towards you? Because you are judgmental, because you saw 5,000 times on the news that sometimes it ends with a murder. Especially middle of the night when there's no cops there. Why are you judgmental? Because the Torah told you, be, be alert, don't be stupid. You see a Nazi with swastika everywhere, you have to be judgmental that he's here to murder me. What is he doing in a Jewish neighborhood walking here? Right away, I have to call the police, you're judgmental. The liberal fools. Why? Why you judge him? If I don't judge him, I'll be dead in five minutes. Or my children will be dead. So all this hypocrisy, don't be judgmental, is only opinions of fools. The Torah forces you to be judgmental. Look in Shulchan Aruch, who you're allowed to be with, who you're not allowed. Who you're allowed to sit with, who you're not allowed. Who you're allowed to marry, who you're not allowed. Who you're allowed to speak, who you're not allowed to stand next to. What about this judgmental? You must be judgmental according to the rules of the Torah. Someone who's known as a thief, when you see him, you have to hide your expensive watch. 
He has a record of robbing people. Someone that take loans and never pay back, you have to be judgmental. Next time when he asks for a loan and cry that he doesn't have money to pay the rent, don't have mercy on him. Judge him negatively. Why? He already did it to 50 other people. It's a crook. Ah, he's crying crocodile tears. Crocodile tears. Don't be influenced. Oh, help me out. I'm, I'm miserable. Miserable. Or he's going to buy drugs. All the drug addicts on the street in Manhattan begging for food. What do they do with the money? Go to buy drugs. They care about food. So we have to know, Rabotai, it is what it is. It's sad, it's painful, but we have to start waking up what we're allowed to hear, what we're not allowed, what we're allowed to watch, what we're not allowed. We have to be very sensitive for it. That's why some people are very smart. Before they want to listen to a new speaker, they ask. I don't know all the speakers in the world. Most of the time, I don't know who they're talking about. But sometimes they talk about a, a known heretic. They just don't know who he is. Even in Israel, same story. So you have, you have to warn the people. Sometimes they want to listen to someone kosher. Yeah, very good, listen, no problem. Sometimes it's the other way around. We're not, it's nothing personal. We're not here to judge people for our personal gain or loss. We are judging people based on the guideline of the Torah. Torah says who is righteous, who is wicked. Who is allowed to be chazan, who is not allowed to be chazan. So our people, he has, he has to say Kaddish for his father. It's his father your side. There are people, according to Shulchan Aruch, you're not allowed to let them be chazan. Ah, they get insulted. The whole synagogue see that they're asking to pray and you don't let them. But that's the rules. Ma, the Chachamim that set the rule, they didn't know that people would be insulted? They didn't know it, they knew it. If someone shave with a razor and you warn him and he continue, you cannot be let him be chazan. Mechalel Shabbat, they're not allowed to let him be chazan. Someone who's an idol worshiper or heretic, you're not allowed him to be chazan. Ah, he's gonna get insulted, so. So a reformed person would come. I wanna marry your daughter. He's very religious now, but he grew up reform. You have to do a conversion. Ma, conversion? I'm a Jew. We don't know. There's no way to know. 230 years you assimilate with the going. That's what they did all over the world. Europe, San Francisco, everywhere, Manhattan. Mary going non-stop for 230 years. Can I rely on your Judaism? But I'm, I'm stupid. Most likely you're not a Jew. You want to marry the daughter. Right now you keep Torah, you learn Torah, you're a great guy. But how do I know you're Jewish? Especially if it's a girl. There are, all the children will be non-Jews. <laughs> the girl is very religious now. But how do we know who's her grandmother? What? What's the origin of their family? From Europe, they already married Goyim. Before they came to America more than 200 years ago. In the time of Moses Mendelssohn, they were already married Goyim. After 12 generations, you can rely on their Judaism? Absolutely have no idea. So, ah, the people get insulted. What can we do? What can we do? We have to follow what Hashem told us. And when Hashem told us what's right and wrong and what does it mean, Chazaka, believe me, He knew that many people would be offended. Many. Kohen Michalel Shabbat, you're not allowed to let him do Birkat Kohanim. He's going to get offended. He's going to, what can I do? Keep Shabbat that I can that I allow to give you. Or Aliyat Kohen. According to Allah, I'm allowed to give him Aliyat Kohen and Michalel Shabbat. Ah, he's going to get hurt. He's going to go home and sit, cry, and get angry all day. It will cause hatred. The Shulchan Aruch didn't know it. They didn't know that people that are excluded in a community, they get angry. They're going to get upset. They didn't know it's going to cause Lashon Hara. They knew. So why they still ruled it? Leave your heart alone. The heart will always give you the wrong ideas. Stick to the head and stick to what's written. And if you're still puzzled, you're not sure, go to the rabbi, rabbi, kosher one. Serious Talmud Chacham, Sfaradi, Ashkenazi, Hasid, doesn't matter. Torah, the same Torah for everyone. He has Rosh Yashar, Hasid, Litvish, Yeke, Sfaradi, Moroccan, Yemenite, it doesn't matter. He has straight head, he knows Torah, he knows Halakha. Ask him what to do, that's it. After he told you what to do, you clean. 
anything that may get wrong later on, it's, you clean, you ask that Torah. If Tzlofchad would, ha, would, he, would ask Moshe Rabbeinu, we wouldn't be here suffering for 3,300 years. Everything will be over back then. 3,300 years of pogroms and holocaust and suffering and who knows what. Because he wanted to be tzaddik. Brok Shabbat. Brok Shabbat. Brok Shabbat. That's all. Why did it? To show people what's the end of Mechalel Shabbat. How they get killed. And for that, 3,300 years of suffering for someone who meant well. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Amen.